Welcome to episode 104 of the Easy Living Yards podcast. Hey guys, I'm super excited for today's show. As usual, I mean, I'm pretty much excited for every show and I pretty much say that for every show too. That's kind of like my standard intro now, right? Well, I am super excited because today I'm welcoming on two members of the Easy Living Yards membership, a husband and wife team who are committed to creating a positive change in their landscape and a positive change in our world because of it. So if you guys are super interested, like me, to hear what Jen and Gary have to say, uh, stay tuned. Guys, if you're listening to the audio version, the podcast of this, I've also recorded a video. We had an awesome video chat together. So if you want to watch the video chat as well, uh, I have a link in the show notes to the YouTube video. And if you guys are watching on YouTube, leave a comment for sure. I'd love to hear what you guys have to say about this show. So today we talk about a ton of different topics, but there are some overarching themes that come out as well. So some of the topics we talked about are uh, (laughs) native plants, providing wildlife habitat, Jen has this awesome background from an uh, like this environmental studies background, um, and so uh, she she kind of weaves that into a lot of her personal uh, practice in her landscape, and so it's really exciting to see. Um, Jen is one of my all she she's my founding member. She's an all star member, uh, and so it's been so fun to watch her journey as they've left. They they basically did some quick tweaks when they first joined the membership to to transform their landscape uh, that they were selling uh, at their home in Florida. And now they've moved to Northeast Ohio and they're trying to create this beautiful space for their family. And so it's really exciting to see that progress. And so, yeah, we talked about some themes like uh, wildlife gardening, like I said, pollinator habitat, uh, butterfly gardening, um, uh, fruit trees, bonsai uh it's it's some cool stuff it's it's a merging of all these cool concepts into something that i hope it turns out to be really amazing and really fun as well it's incredibly unique to as as jen and gary try to kind of combine some of their interests into a design that that overall uh you know helps fulfill some of their dreams with their landscape individually and brings them together to something that really makes something that's a wonderful expression of their relationship together. So stay tuned for that. Um, Also, I want to highlight that um, Jen and Gary are members of the Easy Living Yards membership. And so this is one of the perks of being a member is they get to do this awesome one-on-one interaction with me to work through their landscape. If you want some help like that, go on over to the Easy Living Yards membership at easylivingyards.com slash membership and and become a member today. Guys, I've dropped the price of the membership to 10 bucks a month uh, this year. Uh, you know, as we're dealing with all this crazy coronavirus stuff, I want to make my membership and my help as accessible to you as possible. So this is my way of trying to, you know, kind of help things along there and help us all make a positive difference. Um, so again, themes we talk about eco landscaping, food production, uh, <laughs> bonsai gardening, and, and really the, the overarching theme with all this stuff is taking all these combined interests and turning them into something that, that can really um, become cohesive. Because when you have a lot of different uh, uh, spaces or ideas that you're talking about, um, it's, it can be very difficult or there's a huge risk of, of creating a design that's really scattered and disjointed. And so the big focus here uh, is to to help Jen and Gary kind of bring that together into some sort of a, a cohesive design that has all these different elements to it, but but has a good flow and connection between. So that's a, a one of the themes. The other is preventing overwhelm. They have all these awesome ideas, tons of energy to make all these changes in their landscape. And, and the risk here is for one, becoming burned out and two, becoming overwhelmed. So spending so much time and effort and money and energy on stuff that you can become burned out, right? It can be a lot of work changing your landscape, especially when you're really trying to make it into something beautiful and that provides a positive environmental impact. And so secondly, with that, um, becoming overwhelmed, so many different projects across a a huge space can really cause uh, you to be overwhelmed. And so uh, we talk about strategies and things that Jen and Gary can do to prevent overwhelm. And likewise, in the membership, I also talk about that too. I have course videos that talk about um, uh, prioritizing projects and avoiding overwhelm and setting the right goals and vision for your landscape. And so those are training videos that can really help 
uh, Jen and Gary in, in, in their process and can also help you as well. So we talk about those concepts in today's video as well. So, all right, let's transition over to our chat. Hey everybody, welcome to the Easy Living Yards podcast. I'm excited to welcome Jen and Gary today to talk about their yard. They have an exciting new place. And so Jen and Gary, welcome to the show. Thanks. Thanks. So tell me about your place. Tell me about yourselves. Um, uh, what part of, you know, what part of the States you're from as well as um, what you're looking to maybe get out of our discussion. We are in Northeast Ohio and we moved into our house in the fall. And so we've been eagerly waiting all winter to get to spring so we can actually start growing things. And previously we lived in Florida. So this is our first gardening season in Ohio. Congratulations on multiple fronts. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, I also want to share with everybody that Jen is essentially our all-star member. <laughs> she's the founding member of the Easy Living Yards membership, and she's been a superstar. She's always asking questions and um, has been super uh, engaging from when they lived in Florida to now their new place in Ohio. So it's just so fun to, to watch you and your journey with your family uh, as you guys move to new places uh, and try and really make a positive impact in the space you guys have. So. Thanks for being part of Easy Living Yards. Sure. It's been great. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. And I appreciate you always answer the questions. <laughs> <that I have. laughs> well, I'm glad I can be helpful. So, um, and you've taught me so much about uh, Florida ecosystems, which is really cool. <laughs> so thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, all right. So let's hear about your space and kind of what, you know, this is, uh, I'm, speaking over audio it's kind of tough to you know paint a picture but um if we kind of zoomed out and looked at your you know a google maps version of your property what would it look like and kind of what what are you thinking about your space so we have um two lots and so the obviously the house sits on one and then the lot beside it is is vacant and um and then the driveway uh, goes up the the side of the house, so the garage is behind the house. So on that um, section that is empty, it, right now it's just a, just grass. And the the previous owner, uh, like most of the people on the street, he just uh, mowed the lawn and just kept it as as grass, and that's it. So. And we also have a grassy area in front of our house which is flat for a little while and then has a pretty steep drop down to the sidewalk. Okay. And then we have the strip of land between the sidewalk and the street and that as far as I know, we're allowed to landscape that too. Okay. The, the, some people call that the, the hell the strip. strip. I think. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And how There's wide? Some really large trees in front of some houses, but ours is empty. Okay. Okay. And about for the both lots, then you're talking about about how much property size wise. Um, I I could look it up. I don't recall off the top that's, of my head, but I would. Okay. It's probably um, maybe point three, point four acres. I, okay. I don't think it's quite point four. It's probably point three acres. Okay, but a, a pretty sizable piece of property. Yeah. Yeah, it feels okay. like it. it feels like we okay. have a lot of room. Okay. That sounds really nice. So congratulations on your new space. Thanks. Um, do you guys have any sort of goals as far as what you want with the space or are you still trying to figure that out? Uh, no, go ahead. Okay. Well, <laughs> my main goal is to create ecological habitat for the wildlife. So okay. I'm researching host plants that the caterpillars for the butterflies need. And I've also been researching bees because I, I've thought all along, oh, we need to garden for the butterflies so that they have their host plants. And then I found out that there are specialist bees and yes. they can only okay. eat pollen from specific plants. And that's probably not as well known as the host plants for the butterflies. So I've been researching what specialist bees would eat and what also what bumblebees would eat since the bumblebee numbers are declining. So I've wanted 
make a large part of our property for bumblebees and specialist bees, but then also those also benefit butterflies too, because a lot of those plants are ones that the caterpillars eat and the butterflies get nectar from. Right. Okay. Wow. This is, this is fascinating. So yeah. <laughs> congratulations on your goals. Uh, it sounds very similar to some goals I might have. So that's okay. really cool. <laughs> yeah. So um, in the front yard in front of the house, I want to do a garden focused on bumblebee plants mostly. And then where I need other colors um, or more plants to fill in, then I've been looking up butterfly host plants. Okay. And then in the, the side lot is long and narrow. And in the middle part, we want to do a prairie and Gary planted some trees there, which I'll let him talk about. But we want to eventually turn that into a prairie with really tall plants like prairie dock and the ones that get like 10 feet tall. Yes. Okay. <laughs> and, wow. Yeah. And then in front of that, uh, next to the sidewalk, there's a tree. I'll let Gary talk about that too, that he's planting. And we'll probably do a little kind of foresty understory there. And then in the back, I'm doing a thicket. So where we are in Ohio, it's not naturally a prairie and prairie thicket ecosystem, but I know that those are helpful for the animals and those are also declining, especially the thickets. So I ordered nine plants and put those back in the <laughs> thicket area. And they're small. They're um, probably at the tallest, five feet tall. Okay. And they're pretty bare right now, except for the coral berry. But those will sucker, and so they'll send up more trunks as they grow some of them. And so that should be pretty nice back there. Okay. Okay. So now I'd love to hear what Gary has to say as far as <laughs> your goals. <laughs> well, my, my goal started out, um, I, I'm working on three things in the yard. And, and my, uh, my first thing that I started out doing was when we bought the house, there was a kind of a dilapidated um, picnic, uh, like area it's like a picnic table it was like a covered picnic table is essentially what it was with a brick foundation all this kind of stuff but you know it was definitely very very old wow that's so <laughs> i yeah so i got rid of um the 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 picnic table and the cu cover over it i got rid of all of that and then i thought well what could i do with this bricked area and so i decided to um, pull up all the bricks and turn it into a bonsai garden in which um, what I essentially do there is I start um, trees in the ground in order to uh, get their trunks to a diameter where they're suitable material to uh, start uh, a bonsai with. And so um, all winter long, I've been just like every time we go to a park or on the sidewalk or whatever, if I find seeds that have fallen from trees, I scoop them up. So I've been throwing seeds by the hunt. I've probably, throughout the winter, I've probably thrown a thousand seeds in there. So I'm, I'm waiting for it to really warm up and see what's going to sprout, what's going to germinate. And, uh, and I'll thin them out as I go. But um, in the meantime, um, I was really interested since, you know, this is our first time in, a, in my first time in a not tropical uh, environment. I thought, wow, I'd really like to grow some fruit trees. So I found a place that has, um, um, what do they call heirloom. them? Heirloom. Yeah, heirloom fruits. So this isn't like the type of stuff you buy at a grocery store. Uh, so I, I started out wanting to get um, an apple, a pear, and a cherry. Um, and so... I was going through their online catalog and most of the apple trees said that you have to buy a second apple tree of a different variety in order to get this one to bloom. So I'm like, oh, now I got to buy two of these and two of those. And then it started, the cost of it started really adding up very quickly. And then um, I found one or two where that's not required. It can, it can uh, pollinate its own self. So I bought that. So I have an apple out there, a single pear, and a cherry. And then um, it was only after that fact that it dawned on me that I could have started some apple trees in the bonsai garden to bonsai them and, and utilize them as kind of a way to cross-pollinate a tree. But uh, uh, 
but I'm happy with the, the tree I've got out there. So I, I bought the apple, the pear and the cherry and they came bare root in a, in shipped in a box and they're maybe uh four feet, three or four feet tall. Okay. So, um, so that's exciting. I'm looking forward to being able to pick some apples and you know, that kind of stuff. Okay. Wow. So then at, the, <laughs> at the front, um, when we first bought the house and I was looking at the, at the yard, I, I had this, this picture in my mind of how cool it would be if in that big area on the side yard, if we could have like at Christmas time, if we had a huge Christmas tree right there that we could decorate and light up at, at Christmas time and all the people driving down the street would see this. And so, you know, me being the, the person that I am, I love trees. And so I would, uh, I, a couple of weeks ago, we had some severe weather and uh, it knocked over a couple of streets over, knocked over a blue spruce that went across power lines, and knocked out power to all these houses and all that kind of stuff. So a crew came and, and with their chainsaws and cut it up. And meanwhile, they left blue spruce cones all over the street. So I thought, aha, you know, here, <laughs> blue spruce is a good Christmas tree. So I picked up all these blue spruce cones and took them home and started pulling seeds out of them. And so I, I planted a bunch of seeds out there. And obviously, this is kind of a, a long haul um, objective. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, yeah. in four years, maybe the tree will be big enough to start hanging some decorations on so we'll see <laughs> okay wow so you <laughs> I'm, I'm almost overwhelmed by thinking about all of the work you guys have done as well <laughs> as uh plan to do so this is amazing i love your enthusiasm and i love the the various goals you guys have that's really cool um it, it's clear that you guys love the idea of having your landscape at least to me that's what it speaks so so kudos to you guys for that um i'm super jazzed and energized to see the progress you guys make so <laughs> so at first i want to want to thank you for that <laughs> um i have a couple thoughts and i'm gonna actually you know what i should probably jot these down so i don't forget them um and and some questions too so first um you, the the stuff you were sharing, Gary, is freshest in my mind. So maybe we'll start there. Um, so the bonsai garden—that's such a cool idea. Um, I <laughs> I nerded out in eighth grade and bought or in got like every bonsai book I could imagine finding at the public library uh, because I thought I was going to be this bonsai all star at the time. You know what every eighth grader thinks about. Sure. Um, <laughs> and I I don't know if I've done a single clipping formation of any sort of bonsai work since, but it's, it's such a cool idea. So. Yeah. Well, really, I mean, <laughs> the, the, the magic of making a small tree look large is really boils down to the trunk because the trunk, if, if you have just a little twig, you know, it, it just doesn't, it just doesn't have those proportions. And okay. so the, the way in which to make a trunk, big is to let it grow in the ground rather than in a pot and so you start it in the ground until it gets to a size that is reasonable and then you transfer it to the bonsai pot okay and okay. so um here this opportunity is not only to allow it to allow these trees to start off in the ground but also um, by doing so i can also start to do some initial um shaping and bending and have them the trunks have some curves and some stuff like that. So, okay, so that's really by just by just kind of throwing like handfuls of seeds into the ground. It also allows me to have a choice of what you know what like what trees are healthiest and strongest, and then I can just thin out the ones that are weak and won't work well. Okay, so is the is the concept then uh, the, you've kind of answered what some of my questions were already? Then is is your plan is to to do a transfer process, so it won't be like an in ground bonsai. It'll no. be it's like yeah. a nursery bed for selecting the ones you want. Correct. Yeah. Okay, and and I guess then is the concept you're starting with this kind of wild and crazy scattering, and you'll become more and more focused on the the specimens. Yeah, you want exactly. I mean, I mean, okay. I mean, my opinion is I don't want to 
put a whole lot of work into trying to like scientifically germinate seeds and whatever else. I just want nature to just take its course and I just throw like, like literally just throw seeds on, on the ground in, inside this this area. Okay. And so you're not necessarily looking for like a like specific um like you said specific traits of a specific type of tree you're just taking whatever is available right i don't have specific traits but i do uh, have specific uh trees like um you know i'm very interested in conifers rather than um broadleaf trees although i have thrown seeds of both um into the garden but um, once they start to germinate, where there is a, an evergreen next to a, a deciduous, I would probably remove the deciduous and, and retain the, uh, the okay. evergreen. Okay, um, so that comes to my next thought, and, and you may be more expert here than I am, uh, but uh, specifically you were talking about that blue spruce up front, and then as well as if, if you're doing evergreens for your bonsai, um, a lot of pines require um, fire to germinate the seeds because um, they're mm-hmm. built they're built on a um, that sort of forest ecosystem where there's periodic um, fires that are supposed to happen to to bring about the young so maybe you're f- aware of this already yeah so, I have uh, I, I was aware of that but I am not aware of which species require that I know that okay. there are some that the cones themselves will not open until they are heated by fire right but that that is um that's worked around by me manually opening cones with a, just like a a pair of needle nose pliers and whatnot okay but uh, that's that's a good point as, but as far as which seeds require fire for germination i don't know and so you know if i've thrown those into the bonsai garden and they don't germinate you know there's some other species there that will and so Um, I've probably thrown seeds in there from probably 10 or 12 different species of trees. And I collect these cones, like when we go to a park or, or even in the neighborhood, um, I have found, even if you pick up a cone off the ground, uh, there's always at least two or three or four, uh, seeds that are still in the cone that, you know, if you just pry back the, the, the scales on the pine cone, you can find the seeds. Okay. okay. Did you sell the blue spruce seeds and one started? I did. I I did. So yeah. Yeah. So on the blue spruce ones, um, I I watched a couple YouTube videos and I soaked them in water and one started uh, putting out a root. Um, So I mean, it was tiny. I had to look at. I mean, these seeds are like grains of sand. Right. I had to look at it under a under a magnifying glass to see it. But so then I, I I went and put them out there in the in the area. Okay, great. So it sounds like you guys maybe have done your homework here already. So that's what I was going to suggest is we might want to check for the for the ones you've collected. Do those require some sort of special, like you know, kind of scarification type process? Yeah. Um, to to get them started, but it sounds like at least for the spruce, you saw some starting to germinate. So that's good news. Right. Yeah. Because um, yeah, I don't know off the top of my head which uh, types of conifers require that, and, and in what form. If it's just opening the cone, or if it's some sort of heat, uh, or whatever. So okay, great. Um, okay, so I have another thought, and um, I I don't want this to sound critical. I'm kind of being inquisitive. Is I hear um, the the Christmas tree idea, which I love, by the way. I've thought about like. Maybe we start our own little like decorative Christmas trees in the back <laughs> in our, on our own property. Um, uh, and I hear the bonsai piece, which is kind of like a, a, a fortuitous little spark based on the, the picnic area that was already there, right? And so you utilize that existing structure, right? It sounds like to, a, to, helpful, um, to help along your intended uh, and, hobby. And by the way, let me just throw in for your audience that... Yeah. Um, after i tore down the um picnic area i then found out that uh we're paying additional property taxes on that as being an improvement to the property so (laughs) that 
caused me to realize that we probably were supposed to have we gotten a permit to, get a permit for that. to tear it down, and we didn't do that. So <laughs> probably. I have, to, I have to go to the uh, to the county the auditors, county yeah, and cor county, correct yeah. that error. I don't know if we'll have to pay some sort of fine or something. I have no idea. But yeah, well, yeah. for one, it's 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 awesome that you caught that. But yeah, usually for those big projects, I've kind of come across this blunder on on our own work as well. Um, but yeah, is, is check to see if you have existing structures that are. Yeah, it, yeah, it didn't even occur to me until <laughs> I was looking at like our uh, tax statement mm -hmm. and, and it showed like that vacant lot on the side of our house and it showed that, that it had this uh, Im structural improvement, and I was like, "What's on that lot? That's that's an improvement, <laughs> right?" And then I thought, "Uh oh." <laughs> yeah. 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 So and then we found out, like, even to put a wooden pergola up, you have to get a permit for that. Yeah, a lot of those types of, even for a fence or something, a lot of times it requires a permit. the The nice thing is that it's usually not too expensive, in my experience. Um, and then it really, you know, it depends on the the municipality you're in but also if you come across a blunder and you you go and talk to them they it depends upon the person right the, who's the auditor and that sort of thing but they might just they might be okay with it and say if, as long as you're like yeah. look i removed this i realize now i probably should have had a permit to do it uh, i don't know if you need to come assess it or whatever and they might just say okay um you know what we can we'll take it off of the <laughs> i take it yeah. off of the books I, and i'm and sure it's a lot easier it. To, to um get forgiveness for tearing something down than building something <laughs> building something right yeah. yes <laughs> so. yes um and and actually while we're on that topic too uh since you brought it up another big thing to check is easements too when you're building to make sure you fit within the, the required easements because that's where it really can get a little bit um of a hassle if you do something in a spot that you're not supposed to so yeah, so, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, okay, so so yeah, you have the the bonsai garden, you have the Christmas tree, you have the orchard, uh, and then the the thicket, the prairie, and the pollinator <laughs> garden. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. I just want to make sure I got it all. And so yeah. the I, I think that is all amazing, and it's I I applaud your energy and enthusiasm, and I hope you guys are able to make the. Um, meet the visions that you guys have, the multiple visions here. Um, the, the potential risk is with these varied visions, there's, there's a couple risks. One that you guys might be, and this is, this is a blunder that I've made and continue to make on our own property is, is with multiple different visions that may not be incredibly cohesive at, at all points, is that they can really strain your energy, especially if outside of your landscape and your life gets a little, um, you know, a little stretched or whatever. So, so that's going to be a potential, um, potential concern if you're say like you're halfway through uh, your prairie installation and suddenly life happens and you don't have the time or the energy or the funds to complete the installation and you have a weed problem that pops up or something. Mm -hmm. um, or you're same with like the bonsai or something like that. So um, trying to figure out a a little bit of a structure to um, to which projects might come before the other or which phases of the projects or what spaces might get focused on first um, might help um, rein in that a little bit. So you can say, okay, well, maybe we'll put, and this is just an example, maybe we'll put the, um, the bumblebee space on hold for a little bit in order to focus on the prairie and the bonsai first. And then maybe then we'll phase in, okay, what's the next priority? Maybe it's the thicket or the, the Christmas tree or the orchard. Um, and it sounds like you, you guys already have some of the plants. So the plants you have obviously are the, the first priority, right? And those spaces around them. Um, but that might be a suggestion I have just to, to, uh, to prepare for the potential distractions of life. Uh, and, and, and the not, stress is involved with it. <laughs> not find out after we've invested a bunch of money into new plants that we're overwhelmed by the work. Yeah. Yes, exactly. So yes, so that's one thought. Um, and so just take maybe time to digest that and see if like that fits for you guys and, and maybe how that, uh, especially with, you know, if you have house projects or, or whatever, um, 
which things maybe can wait and which things are more pressing, which are big desires that you have out of your space mm -hmm. that you can, that you want to prioritize first. Um, the second thought I have with all of these different goals is that it can, um, once you implement them, it, it can appear haphazard if you have a lot of different things across your space that um, it doesn't feel as cohesive potentially. Um, and so it's just something to kind of keep in the back of your mind. If you have, it's okay to have multiple goals or have multiple uh, desired outcomes for your space, but being conscious of that potential, and this is more of like an artistic design thing, right? Is, is like thinking of like the curb appeal thing, right? So it depends on how much you want out of that space, but at the same time, you want it also to not feel so disjointed that it feels, um, it, it almost like takes the energy out of you looking at all this different stuff and thinking of all these different spaces. You want it to feel like this is our space. This kind of combines our multiple interests, right? Which is great. And this shows a nice cohesive way. It's almost like an expression of, of your relationship, right? I, I hope I'm not going too far there, but it's like, <laughs> it's like an expression of you guys as, as you, right? As this is Gary and Jen's space we've brought all these things together and it's in a beautiful way that really um, gels together. And, and so just kind of thinking about that and being conscious about it up front might help that happen. And, and maybe it's not, you know, maybe it won't appear disjointed with the way you guys have it. So I'm not being critical of the, the spatial um, array of what you guys are thinking about right now, but just something to think about as you put things together, will it look good and cohesive together. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, and that's mm -hmm. a really good point because um, I, I think what we tend to do is just, you know, get really excited about, uh, you know, maybe maybe we read an article about pollinators and we're like, oh yeah, let's do that. And <laughs> and so all of a sudden we're, 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 we have all these things going on. Yeah, I know, yeah. I want like every plant, like we have to have every plant so we can help out every <laughs> insect. <laughs> But I know it's not possible. And um, Ben, you told me a while ago you thought I would like new perennial design. And so I looked up a little bit about that and never really quite understood what it was. But then I found out about something that grew out of new perennial design, the naturalistic planting look. And I found out about a designer who's in England and he makes these amazing garden beds using is, that Nigel Dunnett. Oh, um, yes. Yes. Have you heard of, oh, it's his yeah. website has so much information yeah. on his plantings and they're beautiful. And he said somewhere, I don't think he does this like all the time, but in a lot of his plantings, he focuses on just two or three um, colors or like flowers coming out at a time so that um, it really just pops out, I guess. And it just really makes an impression because and so I've been looking at plants and trying to plan, you know, what would it look like if we did something like that in different parts? And just like every time, like every month when, when new flowers are blooming, if we just have a focus on maybe three different flowers in a space. And Yeah, that's great. I'm glad that resonated with you. It's, it's more, mm -hmm. again, it depends on how much, how much aesthetics you want out of the space um, mm -hmm. versus the natural benefit, right? Um, but mm -hmm. the reality is it's a human space, right? And so planning for some of the human element is usually helpful, right? Mm -hmm. um, especially for people, you know, that might be walking down your street as well. It, it, it's something that catches the eye and serves a natural benefit, uh, you know, habitat uh, restoration or, you know, helping rare pollinators. Like those are awesome goals and, and doing it in a way where people want to stop and look at the plants too it's it's a win-win situation at least to me so so yeah, yeah, I, think yeah that's great. I, I will say that when we were in florida there was an organization in our town that uh, really did a lot with native plants and they had this annual tour where what you would do is they would give you a map and you would drive to these various people's homes these people would be members in their club and, and these individuals would have landscaped their yards with native plants. And some of the people really made it look beautiful. And like mm -hmm. you're describing where it's a human space, 
And so it's like you can, you know, walk on uh, uh, some little stone steps and you can see the plants. It's really beautiful. And then we would go across town to somebody else's and it, the neighbors hated them. It looked like an abandoned <laughs> house. Yeah, it's, it's like really not hard to like walk completely and wild. And and but but she was like, oh, it's native plants. But mm-hmm. neighbors are, are, yeah, they can't stand her. Yeah. So we definitely we do not want, want to be the person that the neighbors cannot stand. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And since I'm so big into promoting native plants, and I want to start some community projects here. I would like to eventually get native plant tours happening in our community and our house would be one location. And so I want to make sure it looks good when people come, they're like, Oh, I can see how this can be beautiful and not Mm -hmm. a mess and not wild and something that they would want to plant. That's so great. I love your goals. Uh, You guys are, you guys are making me so happy right now. (laughs) Um, Okay. Then I think Jen, we've talked um, offline about this uh, before is, Have you guys looked up, is there a local Wild Ones chapter in your area? I have not looked. I'll write that down. Okay. So Wild Ones is an organization uh, that supports native native homeowner landscapes uh, in in various areas. And so a lot of municipalities have a Wild Ones chapter that's kind of like a, a regional municipal kind of thing, you know, the greater metro area of each pretty pretty sizable town and I can't remember if there's one in your area or not so you might want to check that out okay. um, but they usually have programs and tours just like you guys are talking about uh, that go to different people's homes or, or they'll invite speakers in and that sort of thing so it might be something you guys might be interested in for your area or if you don't have one you guys might be able to help get one started <laughs> yeah, <we can> start <laughs> one yeah we love That's starting <laughs> Maybe maybe let's get your landscape started first. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the other thing too is um, this is something I'm learning with with our space as well is, you know, it's it's just the two of you right now. You know, you don't have a giant construction company helping you, uh, as far as I know, at least, uh, <laughs> no. and a giant nursery next door giving you free plants. And so, you know, this is a time process. You guys probably know this, but it's an investment, right? And and it takes time and investment, not of only, only money, but also time and energy, right? And focus. So um, I, I've certainly um, felt the pain of overstretching myself with trying to do too many things at once with too many different goals. Um, so for example, on our landscape, I want to provide native habitat, fun spaces for my kid, things I talk about all the time on the show, right? Um, and, and also edible landscaping and um, mm-hmm. it, with like perennial based uh, food systems on my landscape. Plus I have to repair everything in my house and I had to re- <laughs> regrade our landscape because it was damaging our foundation, all that sort of stuff too. And so the reality is it's a long-term process is what I'm experiencing. I could imagine you guys might feel the same. And so just to know that don't overpressure yourselves would be my, my <laughs> uh, <laughs> guidance just so you guys don't get burned out. I would hate to see that, that you, know, you become frustrated with the space that you have so much ambition for. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I want to start with getting the shrubs and trees in that we want. And there, we're getting three more trees tomorrow. And then there's some <laughs> other <laughs> tree. There's that like six more trees I want to get. And then I think I'll be done. With so tell them the story trees. about the three trees oh, tomorrow. So we oh, had an emergency. Okay. Situation. <laughs> so our um, the neighbor, neighbors behind us yeah. had, they had a tree line at the between our house and their house, right at the edge of the fence. But the trees were narrow, um, so it didn't give a lot of visual block, but it was a nice, like, I would look out the window in our daughter's room and I would see a tree line. Well, they were growing up into the power lines, and so that might be why they cut them down, but they cut them all down yesterday. Oh, okay, wow. And so now when we look out the window, instead of seeing trees, we see their driveway and their garage and their house. And, and their garbage can. And I their... want a nicer yeah. view. So I was like, we have to get trees. And so I looked through <laughs> my Sibley tree book and found out Redbud would be the best one to fit the small space we have okay, there. Wow. We have wow. a local grower 10 minutes away. I'm going to get three Redbuds tomorrow. Great. What's the what's the tree book you mentioned? Sibley. Sibley. I've never Sibley. heard of that. S-I-B-L-E-Y. 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 Okay. Yeah, it's really nice. It's uh, North American trees. Okay. Yeah, and he I'm writing it down. Yeah. 
it's good. So, and then I want to get some flowering dogwoods um, and some service berries. And okay. then I, all beautiful trees. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, it, yeah. But just because they take so long to establish, so I really wanted to get the trees in soon. But then the garden that I'm focusing on now is, we didn't talk about it, but it's right next to the house on the side. And this it's is, a, edible garden or no it's well caterpillars edible. caterpillar garden okay this is <laughs> yeah, caterpillar so edibles sun, part sun <laughs> area, and i'm putting in uh, one shrub and then some ferns and flowers okay flowers. do you want to so, share any of the just for everybody listening you want to share any of the uh, plants you found and, and why yeah, you selected sure. them yeah so um, it's the smallest garden space, so I decided to start with that one so I could complete that one sooner. And we're only going to get maybe a quarter or a third of it done this year because of our budget. I spent all my birthday money on plants. <laughs> <laughs> Happy <laughs> birthday. <laughs> uh, so I'm I'm trying what's called a matrix planting, and you can use grasses or sedges or ferns and you just make a random matrix with spaces between with that and then plant the perennials in between and then do some scattered or grouped shrubs. Okay. So I got um, one shrub, which is called a snowberry. And I picked that one because it has white berries and it sounded really pretty. There was a shrub in Florida that had white berries that I liked a lot too, also called snowberry, but a different plant. And it also is a host for the clear wing butterfly moth. So maybe we'll get those here too. And then I picked out um, sensitive fern because it can grow in full sun. So I got, I think three of those. And then I picked out um, flowers so that I'd have a focus on two to four of them throughout the growing season. Every time you know, new ones are blooming or they're fading away. So the first ones to bloom will be spiderwort, which okay. has, uh, I think, three purple petals on it. That one actually is yeah. edible, though. Like for oh, humans, I didn't I know spiderwort was edible. Spiderwort? Yeah. It is really. So, I don't know if it will, but. <laughs> and then we're getting, um, I don't know what order they bloom in, but we're getting bone set, which is a cluster of small white flowers. Common milkweed, which looking at the growing requirements for different milkweeds, which is the host for monarch butterflies, I found out that's the only one from the grower I was purchasing from that would actually grow in our soil. So okay. I have to get common milkweed for a milkweed. And we're getting zigzag goldenrod. And then I can't remember. And I just deleted the list off. My okay. Phone. No, no worries. That's, that's, uh, <laughs> yeah. I didn't mean to, to quiz you. I was just curious no, okay. um, what you had and, and for, yeah. for those So there's reasons. different heights of plants. And one thing I actually am doing, I'm not just looking at plants that are native to the U.S. or native to my state. I'm actually going to the USDA website and looking at what's native to my county. Oh, so wow. yeah, not everything great. I'm planting is, but a lot of what I'm planting is native to the county. So, so you guys are, you have your own mini national park. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Okay, great. Yeah, I found that that point really, really interesting because I've always just said, oh, is this, you know, native to Ohio? But mm -hmm. I mean, so there, Ohio could have a, a plant that, you know, only grows in western Ohio and we're all the way over here in eastern Ohio and mm -hmm. maybe it doesn't grow here. So it's an interesting thought mm -hmm. that, that there could be native plants all the way down to like the county level. Mm -hmm. Right. And the point I mean, of doing it for me is that if the plant is native here, then there are probably insects that use it. And if the plant's not native here, there may or may not be insects that can use it. The snowberry actually isn't from this county. I don't believe, um, I could be wrong, but I don't believe it is. But that moth is here. So I figure okay. it could be useful here. That, those are, I mean, that's, that's all great to share because it goes back to your goals. Your goals... Mm -hmm supporting local native pollinators and insects that might be struggling right and so mm -hmm. going back to that and having a clear reason for what you're selecting is great and uh, like you said yeah i mean it makes sense too like um a lot of times i default to well, it's an eastern u.s native right or something like mm -hmm. that but the reality is even from me in southwest ohio to you or southeast south uh, yeah southwest yeah i'm mixing myself up and you guys are in northeast ohio mm -hmm. right and so I'm, I'm below the glacial moraine that's, you know, 
in Ohio and you guys were in a glaciated area several mm -hmm what thousand years million years ago I can't do my math apparently right now. <laughs> um, but yeah there's there's huge differences and you guys get lake effects I'm sure with your weather um, mm -hmm. and so all of those differences factor into uh, what plants do well in your area so um, that's great um, I don't want to take up too much time I really I just looked at the clock here guys um, <laughs> I'm loving our discussion so I, I hope you guys are getting some value out of this um, I had one thought about the plants you mentioned, Jen. Um, just one general caution is that um, common milkweed has a tendency to overrun other things. I have um, heard so, that. <laughs> so you might need to just keep an eye on it. It's, it's a beautiful plant and it smells wonderful when it's in bloom. And it's just mm -hmm. covered with insects that love it too, apparently. Um, but yeah, it does have a tendency to kind of shoot out um, runners and, and um, kind of take over an area. So. Uh, just something you might want to look at and you might have to kind of tend that one a little bit. It just depends on what you want out of the space. I, uh, I've always felt that like with regards uh, for the benefit of the, of the you know, monarchs that whoever named it really did it a disservice. <laughs> the fact that they named it a weed, you know, the lay person's not going to want it in their yard. Right, right. Yeah. And there's so many beautiful plants that are, are have the common name of weed in them. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, before we wrap up, I also wanted to hear um, if, if there's any kind of, for one, if you guys have any plants that aren't yet in the ground that need to get planted. Um, so there's one question. And then the other was, I wanted to hear, Gary, about your, your fruit trees and to understand if you guys had any questions about them or what kind of what you were planning on doing with them as well. So first, do you guys have any plants that need emergency planting? Um, not emergency. We have okay. plants that are coming in May, the second week okay. of May. So those are the ones for the butterfly garden. And I wanna make that a dense planting. So I've been wondering, do I need to follow the spacing guidelines they give or should I plant them closer together than the spacing um, guidelines? You, you can go a little denser. Um, it, you'll fill in faster, obviously, and you'll, you'll reduce weed pressure. And so mm -hmm. you will, of course, also get more competition between the plants. Um, generally speaking, a lot of, like you, you mentioned Nigel Dunnett earlier, um, a lot of these naturalistic plants people, um, they do a denser planting pattern for those reasons. Mm -hmm. It reduces competition between unwanted plants uh, versus the plants you planted, although there is increased competition between the desired plants. Um, you, okay. some, every once in a while you get uh, you know, reduced uh, mature size of the plants or some of them struggle a little bit, but overall most of them actually fare pretty well uh, because you have such varied species in a denser setting. And so if you think about spacing guidelines, a lot of times that's based on ornamental desires or just the mature size of the plant if it was planted by itself only. Um, mm -hmm. Or if you think about typical gardening, right? How to, how to space your green bean, your bush beans, so they don't compete with the same species within uh, you know, a giant row. But here we're talking about, like you said, the matrix planting. Um, and so when you have them densely planted like that, you have some that have tap roots and some that produce um, kind of underground rhizomes that shoot laterally out and some with very fibrous roots and so all these different and then of, of course up above too you have things like spiderwort which has very slender leaves um, and so it's not really like densely out competing everything in that space and then you have your fern that comes in with like dappled shade next to it right and then something that has a bit of a bushier appearance or something or a denser growth pattern and so all these different plants mixed together really actually usually do pretty well because even though they're densely planted, they're not directly competing with each other, mm -hmm. if that makes okay. sense. Yeah, so, I think he said he basically almost plants the plants on top of each other. Yeah. <laughs> so that the space is always filled in no matter what's blooming. Right, right. And so, yeah, it fills in a bit faster, but of course it's a bit more expensive too. So it's kind of a interplay between your budget, your res you know, resources, um, what the mature size of the plants are and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So what about the orchard? Is that what you're calling it or the fruit trees? <laughs> yeah, yeah, the, 
Yeah, I would love to have a big orchard. No, mm -hmm. the, these, I guess my main um, vision for these is just to simply, uh, you know, have my own fruit. Um, that's something that, you know, in, in Florida, really the only uh, fruits are, are citrus and coconuts. I mean, that's, that's about all you get. So for me, it's exciting to be able to plant apples and pears and cherries and whatever else. So. Okay. Okay, great. And, and so you've already planted several of these? I, I planted three, one, one apple, one pear, and one cherry. And okay. the pear has leaves, and we're hoping the other ones will soon. Yeah, <laughs> yeah hopefully, hopefully. Okay, so I do have, a, here in Southern Ohio, I do have, um, so right now it's late April. Um, my, I, I, all, I have a cherry, a, a, you said a cherry, a pear, and an apple, right? Yeah. All three of, all three of mine have leaved out, so um, wow. one, th one thing you can check uh, is we also had a very warm, late winter here. So I don't know if it's been the same for you guys up north a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. So that could affect things. Um, and you said they were shipped dormant too, right? So that's- They were shipped I'm, dormant and they yeah. were shipped bare root. So- Oh, um, bare root too. Okay, so yeah, yeah so that's I'm, what I'm sharing then is totally irrelevant because yeah, they have so to wake I, up from their cold storage basically. Yeah, and I'm sure that there's probably gonna be some shock from you know, waking up from, wherever they were shipped and all of a sudden they're in Ohio, they're probably going to be like, Hey. <laughs> <laughs> right. And so it might take some time. I wouldn't be too worried. And, and your last frost date, I'm going to guess is around like mid May. Is that right? Generally speaking? I don't know when it okay. is. I just know um, the native plant nursery around here at our uh, wilderness center, they start selling in May. So okay. I think May is safe to plant. Yeah, I would guess it, it down here it's early May, and so mm -hmm. you, I'm guess I think you guys are zone five A. I, I'm not sure, but yeah, so um, it, it's okay <laughs> if you don't know. I'm just trying to guess off the top of my head, but yeah, you're still probably not in a stage where you need to be concerned or worried about those trees. Um, I would say give them time, and once they start to warm up, they'll probably wake up, and then. Uh, because you're planting them in the spring, generally speaking, it's actually best to plant uh, um, woody plants in the fall, just because it gives them time to, the roots are still active as long as the ground's not frozen. And, and so it gives them time to establish before the crazy, you know, um, crazy spring growth happens and then the intense heat of the summer and drought of the summer happens. And so the only, it's not necessarily bad that you planted it now, but it's just more that make sure you guys keep an eye on them to make sure they're not getting too stressed. And so it's make sure for one, they're not overwatered, so don't sit out there and water them all the time, but make sure they get a good deep watering. If it's been a little dry, for example, um, and if they need like a top dressing of compost or something or, or um, something similar um, it might be helpful if they're looking a little stressed. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, that's that's great. Uh, the other thing too, it, generally speaking, the, a lot of fruit trees, um, even though you picture an orchard and you know you see these like rows of apple trees and these wide lanes that you can drive your, you know your your hay ride down right to go pick your apples, and it's it's all grassy right, this orchard grass. Well, a lot of fruit trees actually do best with without grass right underneath them within their root zone because they actually generally compete with each other. Um, mm -hmm. And so uh, because the grasses secrete um, chemicals that suppress tree growth and, and some trees, I don't know if uh, uh, fruit trees do, but some trees do the, the opposite, secrete chemicals to reduce grass growth. And, and so that stresses the plants both directions basically. And so if you mm -hmm. underplant with um, some deciduous herbaceous type plants, uh, they they tend to do a little better. And so we can talk uh, more offline about if you guys are interested in, you know, what types of plants you might be interested in that area that we could put under them to help the trees grow better. Well, I was going to put big blue stem and panic grass, so that might not work now. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, I, I mean, let me read up on that more too. Okay. Um, 
but but in general that's that's kind of the the it's it comes from the permaculture space is like mm -hmm. generally you you plant mixed herbaceous species under the trees uh, and partly for that reason yeah okay and how wide would the root systems go like how far out would you need to uh, for do the that? trees yeah generally speaking again this is general but for most orchard type trees you're talking the drip line of the tree so if you're talking okay. at a um you know for quite a few years it's going to be pretty small but as they mature, that's that space is going to get bigger, yeah. And it depends on if you're pruning them and, and tending them. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. um, yeah. Well, I guess before we wrap up, is there any other questions you guys have that you want to talk about right now? Um, I just had a question about soil because I know you know a lot about it. <laughs> and I'm kind of intimidated <laughs> by okay. it. Okay. Find out if we pull up our grass, our soil it's like complete clay like you could do an art project with it it's <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of the spring ephemerals need like what the kind of soil you'd find in a forest more rich soil yeah. i've saw i saw that some will grow in clay but i know that ohio plants can be adaptable too i want to put some spring ephemerals back in the thicket area at some point is the soil going to be a problem do i need to do something so they grow better there. And what are there certain types are are there specific ephemerals you're thinking of right now or are you just talking more in general um in general i think i could say for example i don't know if i'm going to plant this one but columbine i think that needs more of a sandy loamy soil yeah is it from the top of my head that seems trillium. to be correct yeah okay trillium i really yeah. want to plant trillium <laughs> yeah so those those do generally prefer yeah a richer uh humusy soil a yeah. lot of organic matter and but um so yeah what we'll do is um i'll write a few thoughts let's yeah let's talk also in the in the forum about uh that but the the quick recommendation for something like trilliums for example that definitely requires uh, good healthy organic rich soil is is you could do a layering of compost and mulch there basically of okay. good good um good quality mulch so not like the bag stuff that's mm -hmm. diet at the store but some just fresh wood chip mulch and mm -hmm. a dense layer of that you might not be able to plant something like trilliums in the first year in that but uh, give it even just a year um, mm -hmm. and, and that layer of wood mulch, especially if you have, or you can do wood mulch, you could do um, uh, chopped leaves as well back there. So mm -hmm. if you guys get a lot of leaf drop in your area, <laughs> um, you my, <laughs> so my wife kind of rolls her eyes every year, but I, I, <laughs> I hitch up our little utility trailer and I drive around the neighborhood every fall and I pick up people's bagged leaves and I bring them back and run them over the, the lawnmower and uh -huh. they, they, they add tons of organic matter to the soil so you could you could build up that clay soil there pretty quick um, that's what i've done with our annual garden area and it, there was no topsoil there at all it was the same as you guys have as soon as you pulled up the grass it was it was super dense clay and mm -hmm. by adding you know some some uh some of this chopped leaves there over the course of about two years and a bunch of mulch it it turned into six inches of dark like really dark brown soil that was great for for planting so it takes a little time to to create for sure but if you put the raw materials there the microbes will do the job for you and it's really great so um before something like trilliums which definitely requires it um you might want to do that something like columbines I, i'll have to look that up again but um i don't know if there is they might be a bit more forgiving so it depends on the mm -hmm. certainly depends on the ephemeral you're talking about yeah I read that Virginia bluebells will grow in clay. Okay. I want to plant those too. So. Can at least get. I, <laughs> I'm already jealous of your property, you guys. It's it's so amazing. <laughs> so I love your energy. Um, yeah, let's. So I'm super excited to keep talking with you guys throughout this season. So make sure you reach out with any questions, and I'm happy to chat. We can always reconnect on a video chat like this, or or in the forum, or just shoot me an email, whatever. Is most convenient to you all right so thank you guys so much for joining today you i bet. really appreciate it thank you yeah thanks
All right, guys, I don't know about you, but that was awesome. Um, I love talking with Jen and Gary. I'm so energized to see all the energy they have and the progress they've made already is amazing. Um, and just Jen, she's like a great, a crazy knowledge base too of all this cool stuff. She has so much passion for for native plants and for wildlife and stuff. And the, to see how she can bring that into the, her own landscape and to... Um, to create, you know, how driven she is to create that positive space. She's teaching me stuff too. So it's really cool. And seeing Gary's passion for all these, you know, more diverse interests is really cool too. Um, <laughs> bonsai is something I had this, you know, I have like 5 million hobbies or uh, desired hobbies. The reality is I don't have the time for it, right? Well, bonsai was one of those things that just I've always found fascinating. So um, it's really cool to see what uh, Gary is trying to do with that space. You know, basically something that was a problem, he's turned into a, a really creative uh outlet for for one of his hobbies which i think is super cool so anyway guys again the themes for this um you know that I, i've i'm seeing emerging here is is one um to to create a design that kind of merges everything together and i've already had some follow-up discussion with jen in the forum the community forum for the membership and um jen is um weaving kind of between their front yard garden and their side garden. The front yard garden, she's calling the bee garden. The side garden is um, the butterfly garden. And so between those spaces, there's some, by merging some of the similar plants and similar blooms, times and and um, layout, uh, like uh, style between the two spaces, it, it, it kind of brings a cohesiveness to it. And so that's a way to, you know, take all these different elements, but still kind of bring them together from a design standpoint to make it feel fluid, to make there feel like there's flow uh, between the spaces, and to make it feel like one, you know, cohesive property, as opposed to a bunch of disjointed pieces that don't necessarily flow together, or don't necessarily marry well together. Together. And so this is a, a really big thing when uh, people are, you know, we, us, we are creating our landscapes is if we have different ideas, um, it, how to, how to bring it together in the same space to feel like a good quality design. So that's a key here. Um, something that we'll continue to work on. Uh, I'll continue to work on with G Jen and Gary um, to make sure we're continuing to do that. Secondly, the other piece is with all these crazy ideas, uh, <laughs> crazy in a good way, all these crazy ideas and all these different ideas across the whole space of their landscape, you know, it's an entire transformation of the landscape, right? And so how do you do all that without becoming completely overwhelmed? And that's where, you know, taking pieces step by step, finding the right priorities, um, the right timing to do things uh, that, uh, based on your time, your budget, um, the resources you have, the, the urgency of each project uh, really helps determine the prioritization of things and how to get things done. So again, if you're transforming your landscape, make sure you're aware of that stuff too. Also, if you want to, you know, jumpstart your landscaping process, you want to help, you know, figure out how to have the right design like this, how to work through the process, how to prevent becoming overwhelmed. That's what the Easy Living Yards membership is for, how to select the right plants for your space as well. So if you're considering, uh, you know, making this major transformation to create a positive change in your landscape, head on over, check out the Easy Living Yards membership at easylivingyards.com slash membership. Become a member today. It's just 10 bucks a month. That's super cheap, super affordable. And that's my purpose to help as many people like you to make a positive change in your landscape. So head on over, check it out. I've got all the links in the show notes as well, or in the, you know, in the notes below, uh, if you're watching the video. Um, so check those out. Uh, awesome books I've referenced there as well. So if you, um, if you're looking for some resources, um, there's some great books, um, bringing nature home, awesome book on perennial, <laughs> or, I'm sorry, uh, perennial plants mostly, uh, but uh, to sustain wildlife and to really support, insects and birds that are beneficial for wildlife um, and for habitat as well. So secondly, the No Maintenance Garden by Roy Diblick, awesome book for providing awesome templates of these perennial plants, uh, native plants, uh, beautiful native gardens uh, that you can do in your landscape. So on another awesome book there. Um, Planting a New Perspective is a great book by Noel Kingsbury and Pete Aldolf. A bunch of inspirational uh, design photos uh, that are throughout the book. It's kind of like halfway between a textbook and a coffee shop book. I find it super entertaining. I don't know if you will, but it's also very informative and has a lot of inspirational photos that are very helpful. 
check out those books. Awesome books. Uh, guys, thanks for staying tuned in this show. Um, and uh, I look forward to seeing you in the membership. Cheers. And of course, let's sign out properly, right? Thanks for tuning in. Make sure you live with passion and make tomorrow better than today.